Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Easy Power Tuesday Refresher Series. My name is Jim Chastain. I'm an applications engineer here at Easy Power. And uh, today we're beginning the first of a four part series focused on protective device coordination. And for the most part, we're trying to start at the ground level, pardon the pun. And uh, today, is, in particular, we're going to be dealing with some very basic system landmarks, if you will, and the tools that we use to look at coordination. And uh, we'll get into more depth as we go farther into the series. So again, welcome to all. We'd like to start with a poll question or two, if you wouldn't mind participating, we'd appreciate it. First poll question is regarding a typical facility, how long since coordination was updated in facilities that you're familiar with? So there's no right or wrong answer, just some feedback. We're trying to get a, a bead on kind of the perspective you're coming at the discussion this morning or today. The webinar is being recorded and uh, will be posted to the website as a video along with PDF copies of the slides. All right, let's leave this about another five seconds. Looks like we're close to a quorum. All right, here's how folks have responded. It's like a pretty wide distribution. Now, realistically, you don't have to, I mean, theoretically, you don't have to do a coordination study that often uh, because it's part of the initial commissioning of the building and the equipment. But if there's any chance that anything was changed or that loads have changed or that anyone has uh, replaced fuses, there's a need to potentially see if anything has been modified. So the second question is, has your facility experienced a transformer or other equipment failures due to improper coordination? Again, this is just a curiosity. There's no liability or obligation. And hopefully the answer is yes. I make that no. <laughs> Sorry. Didn't wish anybody ill will. Okay, let's give this another five seconds. <clears throat> and here's where folks have weighed in on this. So yeah, the uh, looks like almost 20% and possibly more could be uh, the root cause of the problem. So that's why we review this, and especially with a lot of junior engineers coming into the market, well, there's a need for reviewing this material periodically. So today's agenda basically is to talk about the purpose of coordination and some basic guidelines of standards that are used to uh, make an even footing as far as how the analysis is done and what, how we can uh, work with manufacturers to understand the workings of the, uh, the equipment that could be fairly expensive and difficult to uh, deal with if we don't have more information about its operation. Uh, then we're going to get uh, into the available tools. First and foremost is understanding uh, what's represented on the TCC plots and then how Easy Power controls the faults that affect the analysis and then the parameters specifically for transformers and motors. So again, we're barely scratching, scratching the surface but it's all vital information for the overall topic. So protective devices have a number of particular functions in system design. First and foremost, they protect the equipment from excessive temperatures and uh, ex excessively high loads or faults to minimize equipment damage. They often uh, reduce the risk of fire and explosion and potentially reduce the risk to personnel. Often it's required as part of a legal uh, document, specifically the code when we talk about commissioning a plant or a new facility. And then frequently it'll, it can be part of an insurance uh, coverage issue to make sure that you have 
the proper devices in place to protect the equipment. Well, the term coordination is slightly different, and most often we're talking about what's referred to as selective coordination. But in a coordination study, the intent is to look at the characteristics of the protective devices and determine optimum device settings to ensure that the system reliability is improved. And that is, you know, subject to the protection of the system components, we want to achieve minimum interruption for different types and magnitudes of faults and overcurrent. So a, a acceptable selective coordination is obtained when a minimum amount of equipment is removed from service uh, based on a remote fault. Now often selective coordination will result in higher arc flash incident energy. So we'll find that there's always this offsetting balance or offsetting requirement that if we want to uh, increase mitigation, then there's a penalty we need to pay in, potentially in coordination and vice versa. Coordination again, potentially means higher incident energy, at, especially at the upper elements because we're having to set their timing slower to allow the downstream elements to work first. And it's it goes without saying that this is usually done with, in conjunction with a short circuit study. So here's how something like this works. Here's our one line diagram. And we're considering selective coordination for loads that are going to be at the end of these feeders. If uh, we have a remote fault, let's say a fault on this particular bus or load, that current, that fault current is going to be sensed or felt by three different protective devices. The primary fusing in, this, in the uh, transformer, the main breaker to this distribution on the panel or switch gear, and then the feeder breaker that's closest to the load. So ideally, or, uh, realistically, any one of these breakers or protective devices should trip at some point. The goal is to make sure that this feeder breaker trips first and thereby preventing the loss of energy or control to the rest of this, the operations. For instance, if we lost the primary fuse and the whole plant goes down, because of a simple fault at a, a small motor, it would be uh, onerous as far as the amount of lost productivity for something that could have been avoided. Well, the tool that we use to verify this and to make this adjustment of recommendations is called the time current characteristic curve. And it's this mechanism has been around since uh, the early days of, of uh, switches and breakers, and it is used and uh, specified for devices such as transformers, loads, overcurrent protective devices, and even cables. And what it does is allows us to predict safe operation and potential areas of uh, damage uh, by comparing the short circuit current or the even the, the operating current in a particular load to the upstream devices. Now, it's not all that magical. These, similar to every other plot that we've ever seen in, in our education, the difference being we have current on the horizontal axis and time on the vertical axis, and we are in the process of doing a short circuit study, we're predicting the current that will occur on a, on a specific bus downstream of a downstream fault. Now, the term inverse curves is applied to overcurrent protective devices, and it basically means the higher the current, again, the current's on the horizontal axis, then the quicker the response time of the protective device. Now, just for this illustration, these, we're not going to get into the details of these types of devices, but this gray plot is a typical curve for a molded case circuit breaker. The blue plot is a typical f curve for a low voltage power circuit breaker. And then the red or rust colored plot 
is a typical uh, profile for a fuse. If we, in our uh, short circuit study, determined that the fault current at this bus was 5,000 amps, then we would plot that value on the in the vertical direction intersecting with the 5,000 amp point, and where that curve crosses the upper or right-hand boundary of the trip curve for that protective device, that tells us what the trip time is or what the time to clear the fault will be if that equipment were utilized. So for instance, at 5,000 amps, it looks like the moldy case circuit breaker would trip in 20 milliseconds. If that didn't clear, then the low voltage power circuit breaker will trip in 300 milliseconds. And then finally, if neither of those cleared, then the primary fusing looks like it would clear in about 80 seconds. And again, its primary function is to prevent a fire, usually in the transformer. It's relatively easy to see or to be able to make the statement at 5,000 amps, this system is series coordinated. Question about uh, whether or not presentation slides will be available. Yes, we'll make a PDF copy of the slides available, and it'll be posted at the same time the video is uh, listed on our website. Everyone will receive a notice on that. Now, what we're going to focus on is protecting specific elements. And transformers are the most expensive, usually the most expensive element in a system. And they need to be protected from overloads, from internal faults, through faults. The transformer damage curves only deal with through faults, not internal faults. And basically, if you have an internal fault, the equipment's already damaged. There's already a short or an open in the transformer. And then the TCC itself is not particularly useful. Now, a through fault basically is defined as an external fault on the second area of the transformer. And it's just a fact based upon the turns ratio that the windings see very high current when we have an external fault. For instance, for a 5% impedance transformer, the current can be as high as 20 times the full load current. And this especially is uh, an issue when we're talking about heating and magnetic forces because they are based on the square of the current. And so for current that's 20 times the full load current, the forces from the heating and magnetic elements or current could literally be 400 times what normal stress would be. So through faults, again, is prevents overheating of windings due to current. It also prevents mechanical damage due to the magnetic forces because windings are inherently repel each other. And if we see a large surge of a fault, that large uh, magnetic force could be mechanical damage to the core or to the windings themselves. The ANSI standard C57.109 is utilized to, or has been developed to define transformer damage curves and define the magnitude and duration of through faults that a transformer should be able to uh, withstand. And so there are tables and uh, plots in ANSI C57.109 similar to this, where it gives us a definition of certain categories, both for single phase and three phase, and then different size ratings, and then whether or not they are subject to or should be considering frequent faults. And this will make a little more sense when we see the TCC curve. But basically on the larger transformers, uh, the susceptibility to frequent faults is more significant. And consequently, they're only allowed five frequent faults during the life of a transformer. Whereas on a category two, or potentially it could survive 10 frequent faults over its life. Now this again makes more sense when we look at the protection curves or the TCC curves. So this is a typical damage curve. And again, what we would do is predict the current in the individual downstream bus 
And then that tells us whether or not it's going to intersect the damage curve of the transformer. So this plot is based on an ANSI C57.109 oil rated transformer of 1,000 kVA with an impedance ratio of 5.75%. Again, this is all information that's entered during data uh, collection. And so it's important to get the data accurate when we're doing uh, data collection. The upper part of the curve is referred to as the thermal damage uh, section. And you'll see, we'll see where that's indicated in the plot. And then the mechanical damage section is at the higher current range. And it's offset from the 100% uh, damage curve. So again, we're protecting at lower currents, longer time exposure from thermal damage and higher current for shorter time uh, was protecting or avoiding mechanical damage. So the protection, and I'll, we're going to go into easy power here, and I'm going to show you where this is set up. But protection based on the frequent fault is conservative. And let's kind of do that, show where that is coming from. So here I've got a one-line diagram with three different transformers of the different categories that they give us descriptions of. So a CAT1, again, the specifications are critical because that's going to define the type, class, and rating of the transformer. Now, taking a step aside, one of the things that we recommend during data collection is to take a digital image of nameplates and transformers are particularly valuable. The tool allows us to connect a, a image of a transformer, in this case, and carry it with the project. So at any given time, we can look at the label or the nameplate and verify that we've got the correct data entered or that someone originally set up the one line has been uh, properly recording the data. So again, that's just a feature of EasyPower. Now that that label or that nameplate is not for a CAT uh, 1 transformer. So it was just for illustration. Now the point I'm trying to make is that once we've got the data entered, when we go to plot the TCC curves, by default, all four of these checkboxes are filled in. And what that gives us is a, a TCC plot that looks like this. The, the module that we use for coordination, we, we refer to as protection and coordination, and it allows us to save TCCs. So I've already created this TCC plot showing all three transformers. And in this case, they're color coordinated. I'm not sure you can see that on the screen. So real briefly, what's noticeable right off the bat is that this is a straight line and this is a square what's loosely referred to as a z curve with a jag in the middle here this is referred to as a frequent fault curve versus the cat one transformer which doesn't have by definition frequent fault curve availability so if i go back and look at the setup we're asking for a frequent fault curve in the smaller transformer, but because ANSI C57.109 uh, doesn't have one, there's no jog in this plot. Whereas we go to the CAT2, we're asking for a frequent flyer, a frequent flyer, frequent damage curve, frequent fault curve. If I uncheck that box, watch what happens to the plot, this middle one. So what this means is, this is 100% damage curve. I never want to have any current time plot be up and to the right of this dotted line. However, on frequent faults, this transformer should survive whatever is listed in ANSI C57.109. I think it was five. Uh, it should survive five excursions of this particular part of the curve. The bottom line is, if we protect the transformer, even to this curve, it's a, it's most conservative, and we're ensuring that it never gets to the 100% damage curve. 
Uh, let me kind of check a couple more Keystone points. Uh, we'll talk about the unbalanced derating here in a second. Um, we'll talk about magnetizing inrush in a second. The stall, the uh, damage curve is again plotted on on a certain range. And right here we're showing it from two seconds to 500 seconds. The maximum range on the current is, uh, well, let's take that a step back. Right now we're plotting everything at 480 volts. So all these currents are referenced to fault at, at, on the 480 side. If we wanted to plot them with reference to 13.8, the tool allows me to change my reference point and it skews all of that current to the left. And now we're looking at equivalent current in the 13.8 range. So if we were uh, setting primary protection for these devices, this would be the uh, current that we're expecting to, to measure 697 amps in the 13.8 range. And that's all being illustrated here in the range that we're, sh we're showing for 13.8. Now we talked about the inrush, we haven't talked about it yet. Inrush is also based upon the uh, parameters that we've input into the tool. And in this case, typical values are eight to 10 times full load current and a six cycle uh, time delay. So what this means is if we're going to ha have protective devices set up for the transformer, they don't want to be sensitive enough to be tripped by th the current inrush when it's first energized. Now this applies only to primary protection. And I think I got more information on that as we're going along. Um, so I mentioned well, three transformers that I've shown here. There's a delta Y with the Y grounded, delta Y with the Y grounded, and they're all the same. The, uh, the problem comes up if I have a delta Y fault on the primary, on the secondary side, that's a single uh, line to ground. And the per unit seen in the primary protection, it's not the same current as seen in the secondary winding. For instance, if we're looking on a phase to phase comparison through faults on, on a three phase fault is equivalent. But if we have a single line to ground, it's not equivalent. And this is the reason. So in normal operations at full load on the Y side, if we're measuring one per unit current, it corresponds at least in magnitude uh, per the turns ratio to the mag to the one per unit on the primary side, uh, but it's not it's not a direct correlation. It's because we have two phases involved, and each one is 0.58. So my total per phase is going to be a one per unit that corresponds again with to the turns ratio in the secondary. Now that's all well and good if we're talking about three phase faults. However, if we have a single phase fault on the primary, so we have a through single phase fault and we're trying to protect or sense it on the primary side, then we're, we can see that if we only have a 0.58 per unit current, that corresponds to a one per unit fault on the secondary side. So ignoring the load current, the primary relay or fuse will only see 58% of the uh, per unit current that we've been monitoring for three phase faults. So what that means is we need to offset that that uh, damage curve by 58%. And this is what's referred to as an adjusted ground fault seen from the primary. So let me see if I can illustrate that. I've actually saved that plot.
So what we're talking about is single line to ground and ground protection. And the fact that we have to uh, consider this rating, the 58% lower rating when we're monitoring a primary current. So here we have, here we have actually three situations where we have high resistance ground as indicated by this resistor in the neutral connection on the uh, Y side. Here we have a hard ground and here we have a delta Y with no ground. Probably should have done a delta delta because they're similar. All right, so let's look at the uh, hard ground first. What we see when we look at the parameters that we've set up is that we've checked this box which says plot the unbalanced D rating of 58% for the TCC. And so that's given us this jag in the uh, current. Let me uncheck it and see what it looks like. So if I uncheck that block, again, it takes away that part of the curve. Now, what does it hurt? Well, it doesn't hurt anything as long as we're trying to coordinate for three phase faults. But as soon as we look at a single phase fault or a line to ground fault, then that 847 amps isn't compared. Let's see if I can. Well, we'll see it when I, when I use my fuse. Let's see if I can pick it up this way. Okay, so by putting the fuse in there, the tool is showing me the maximum current through the fault of 847 amps. So that 847 uh, amp current corresponds to 934 amps uh, asymmetric. And if I set this as my reference for scaling, that current is the current that's going to be experienced by the transformer. And I want my protection to fall between or at least high enough so that it never exceeds that current doesn't exceed this uh, second plot. I did a poor job of explaining that, but the point is normally on a three phase fault, I could set uh, my, my current up protect against a three-phase fault and never hit the frequent fault curve here. But on a single line to ground, which is what we're looking at, and a fault here, that 847 amp protection needs to be reduced so that it doesn't exceed this derated curve. Okay, um, I could have done better on that, but let's, let's see what else I wanted to do. Um, I do want to compare all three. So there's a difference. Yeah, so I want to look at the three um, plots for the high resistance ground, right? This having this resistor in the neutral leg or the ground leg of the Y side guarantees that the maximum current on a fault here will not exceed 10 amps. So a fault here, we're showing 10 amps or 100 amps, I'm sorry. It's 100 amp resistor, which will mean we have a 2 amp fault on the primary, and you'll notice we don't show a derating curve. Well, that's because this 2 amp protection, this 2 amp fault, isn't anywhere on threatening to uh, to my to damage the, the core itself. But I do need to set my if I have uh, protection monitoring this, I do need to set my protective relay or fusing to trip at something less than two amps. Okay, let's see if I want to go back and look at the hard ground we looked at. Uh, the other one I want to look at is the no ground. So when we have an ungrounded system and a three phase, uh, a single phase fault to ground, Again, we have no derating current 
because there's no ground current. By definition, we we have an we have ungrounded system, and so there won't be any ground fault current to uh, measure. If we go back and look at a three phase fault, they, then again we're looking at the frequent fault curve, and we set our protection so that we're uh, not. We'll get into this more for transformers in the next couple of uh, weeks. But I'm just trying to talk about the milestones that's being displayed for different types of transformers. Hugely valuable information, but it's important to know what type of fault I'm applying and where I'm looking at the current for protection. So this whole derating ground fault, we're talking about the primary protection and a single line to ground uh, where we have to derate the curve. Now, uh, part of uh, the, any, the National Electrical Code is overcurrent protection. Again, we'll get into this in more detail, but this is table 450-3 and talking about the primary protection and secondary protection. These numbers represent the maximum protection for a fault on the primary side can be as high as 600% of full load current. And that doesn't mean it have to be, it just means at a maximum, that's where we want to set it. And when we get into coordination, this is something that will come into play. And again, this is part of the National Electrical Code. I referred to the NRESH uh, plot earlier, but what it amounts to is that during initial energization, there's a potential for current and a host of different harmonics to be launched at the time the transformer is powered up. And that's, as we saw in the, uh, the data block for the curve, that's represented based upon some multiple of full load current and some delay time. In this case, I think it was uh, 0.1 seconds. Um, and we want to make sure our protective devices will not be sensitive to that particular current and time element. So for primary protection, we must have the protective devices up and to the right of the inrush plot. All right, so then the last thing I wanted to cover was motor time current characteristic curves. And just like the transformer, all this is based upon data that we collect when we're drawing the one line or we're collecting data for the model in easy power and the, the tcc looks like a chair for a, a motor starting curve at least an induction motor and uh, these all have a relevance to uh, parameters in the setup we'll get into easy power and look at that but what we're looking for first of all is acceleration time once we apply across the line voltage, the motor is at uh, what stands still. That's referred to as a locked rotor con condition. And so where this vertical line extends down and intersects our, our axis, that's referred to as locked rotor current. And that current will be normal or acceptable until the, the motor is accelerated. So the time of this particular cross member is referred to as acceleration time. So it looks like we have an acceleration time of about five seconds on this motor and a locked rotor current of looks like uh, 4,000 amps. Now, there's a tail that we refer to as the asymmetric offset. And it's very similar to uh, NRUSH. And it's based upon worst case, what we're plotting is worst case on the phase as we energize the motor and the, the current. And, and I'll, we'll look at easy power and we'll see where this is set. But again, that needs to be uh, accommodated when we're setting protective devices to differentiate between a normal start and an abnormal start. Any time current plot on the left side of the chair is considered a normal starting. Any time current plot to the right side of the chair 
would be considered an abnormal start, potentially abnormal start, and we would want to have protective devices uh, that came into play. Now this slanted stubby line is the thermal limit stall time curve, and any time current exposure to the upper right hand side of this straight line uh, means the motor is susceptible to damage, physical damage at that at that time. So this is one of those limits that you never want to exceed. And then the, the, the uh, vertical intersection between our motor starting curve and the upper axis looks like it's about 600 amps. That's the full load current as defined by the setup of the motor. So now that we've got all that kind of defined, let's go back and look at Easy Power and see what we got. So most of this information, well, again, the slides will be available on the uh, on the website when we post the video. Most of this information is also on other uh, webinars that we've done specific to motors and to uh, protective devices. So again, in database edit, I've uh, found the motor icon from the equipment palette and put it in my system, in this case, 480 volts. If I open the dialog box for the motor, and again, it, there are times that I may want to actually take an image of the motor nameplate and save it. But the primary thing that the uh, tool is looking for is horsepower. And so once I put the horse, it's indicated when we set it up with a red exclamation point. Once I put the horsepower in there, the tool calculates my uh, KVA rating. If I want to plot the full load current, I can click this little calculate button and it looks up on the NEC tables the full load current for a 50 horsepower motor. And then the tool recalculates my KVA. So if we skip that part, you can see it recalculates the KVA based upon the horsepower, efficiency, and power factor. So that's the specification tab. When we go to the short circuit tab, this X over R will be blanked out. And mandatory, the tool will calculate the X over R for me. And then when I go to the TCC curves, I indicate what type of starter we're using. Again, we're plotting a full voltage, 50 horsepower motor. That's an individual uh, motor load. The locked rotor multiplier is six times. And again, this is a default value. If I know my system has a different uh, locked rotor multiplier, I'm welcome to use it. Likewise, the asymmetric offset is 1.6 times that uh, locked rotor current. Uh, here's where we're plotting the thermal curve. So let's kind of go ahead and plot this. I've already plotted and saved it, so I can come back and open it up. It's a little bare with all, without the text there. But if I go back and open the dialog box, you can see that my thermal limit curve appears because this checkbox is there and it's being plotted with these parameters from 10 seconds to 200 seconds. Acceleration time was five seconds. If we have a quicker acceleration time, we can put in three seconds. Expect the motor to, to uh, the uh, acceleration to reduce. Yeah. And then if we have uh, different locked rotor multipliers, now these are used for voltage drop calculations in uh, load flow and for starting curve protection plots from. Uh, for coordination. Okay, so that's motor starting curve. So for, so far we've covered the uh, TCC definitions for transformers and motors. 
we've looked at the uh, keystone points for transformer damage curves for single and three-phase uh, faults. And I think that's everything I was wanted to cover in this particular session. So if you would, please, let's do a little poll question to make sure we're, we're covering the bases. So a protective device coordination is a procedure which will do what? So if I didn't lose my polls, okay, let's see if I get this across. So protective device coordination is a procedure that does what? All right. Let's give this another 10 seconds. Appreciate your participating. Uh, it's no liability, just to make sure I'm covering all the bases. So uh, one of the things that's important to re remember is that coordination very frequently increases the arc flash exposure on the particular bus. So you don't want to get confused between mitigation and coordination. It's uh, an issue that will come up frequently when we get into uh, arc flash protection. So transformer protection is critical because this one's kind of a throwaway. Yes, so let's give this another 10, 10 seconds. So yeah, the correct answer is all the above and uh, didn't mean to pull it on you. Probably should have put all that below. But yeah, protective device coordination is critical on transformers uh, because they're expensive and they affect the whole plant. And realistically, uh, you're going to take a long time if you have to replace one. So transformer protection is particularly valuable. And then finally, what is the proper data entry why is proper data entry important when constructing a one-line diagram? And this one's, this is something I, I actually want to hammer home. And that is the more accurate, the more detailed data we can collect. And frankly, when you're doing an arc flash study, the data collection portion can be 50% or more of the time involved in doing the study itself. And that's because on older systems that haven't received a study before, it's sometimes difficult to get, get all the data. So the more data that can be collected, the better job you can do both for coordination and for mitigation. Okay, that completes what we wanted to cover today. Thank you for attending. And uh, by all means, uh, make sure you check out the updates on the schedules for more uh, webinars and training, both online and live training that's scheduled for later in the year. And we look forward to talking to you next week. Have a good day.